Hey everybody, I'm Blaze Omukoa, the writer and creator of One Sun Comics. Today I'm here with the founder of Pono Comics. He is an editor, a letterer, a jack of all trades really. Um, he's the writer and artist of characters like Windsurfer and Captain Pono. I'm here with Carl Larikeha Shinyama. So um, how's it going, Carl? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you make me sound much better than I and then I actually am, so I appreciate that. Well, like I was saying, you know, I, I have been following your page um, since I was around 17. I am saddened by the, uh, well, not so recent loss of the Captain Marvelology page, but I'm excited to see you bring it back in any way possible. Um, so I've been following you for a really long time. Um, and if you could tell me a little bit about how you got started um, and, you know, where, what your your origin story is like. Oh, uh, so... Um... I've been wanting to draw for a very long time, but growing up, I never really had the confidence. It wasn't until I was about 25 years old that I thought, hey, you know what, maybe if I took um, how to uh, draw comics a little more seriously, that maybe I could get a lot better. And so I spent a lot of time and years learning the craft, making comics. It wasn't until about two years ago I decided to get into editing comics. And I used a lot of the, the things that I learned, you know, art, writing comics, lettering, and, you know, use that to help other people make their own comics. So professionally, I've been uh, making comics for about two years now. Uh, before that, though, I did, um, I'm sorry, you mentioned Captain Marvel. So uh, before that, I was running a fan page. And so um, that was my caption, you know, to help people learn more about my favorite character. And I shared my passion and knowledge with everyone who was also a fan of the character or who may be new to the character. Do you still, is that page still active on um, X? I, I don't use that app anymore. No, not really. Uh, unfortunately, I kind of got tired of, you know, social media and there was a lot of negativity. So I decided to just take a break from that and just focus on more on um, more constructive use of my time, which is, you know, making comments. Absolutely, absolutely. So who would you say, like, did you have any um, comic creator, creation inspirations uh, when you were coming up? Uh, yeah, Michael Turner, um, my all-time favorite artist. He's actually what got me into drawing again. I saw his Supergirl cover, the DC comic, way back when, back in the, um, the 2000s. And that's what got me to pick up a pencil again. Just inspirational. And there are others like um, Ryan Otley. He's one of my favorite artists. I love his energy. I love his style. Um, and then there's, you know, some of the others like Alex Ross and Dan Jurgens, who in the 90s, their art, you know, inspired me still to this day to keep making comics and draw. Um, so I think as far as um, writers, I could definitely say, uh, let's see, Robert Kirkman. He was a huge inspiration for me wanting to make my own comic. Because he kind of um, blazed the trail for a lot of us in the modern indie uh, scene. Because he's the example of someone who could, you know, come from almost nothing. And in fact, um, gamble his entire financial future on the success of Invincible and Walking Dead. But he went into huge amounts of debt. And he showed us that you can go all in and still make it happen and you know to this day i find that inspirational and i'm not Absolutely. to mention his writing is fantastic i love his writing style i love how he uses um a, a plot a and then graduates um a subplot to the main plot and he does it continuously it's just a brilliant way of writing absolutely uh i was recently watching a video with um it was, it was about all the image founders and um Kirkman was talking about, I think it was Mark Silvestri, like picking him up, like taking him to the air airport and stuff like that. And I was just like, see, this is how it happens, you know, um, just just meeting these people and you find out they're almost exactly like you and they have the same interests and, and whatnot. Um, so so I'm sure it was, it was different for you, um, especially like art um, as opposed to, you know, um, I'm more of the film side kind of thing. What resources did you use to, to learn how to draw and also how to write? many different resources I, I wish i could name them all but um i got whatever art book that i could use uh baron hogarth is a big one for me um so is um uh what you call it uh, the name the method for drawing here the name is escaping me um 
I wish I could recall it off the top of my head, but um, I want to say Bridgman, but it, I don't think that's right. But there were a lot of books I learned how to draw, and it was just the fundamental stuff. I even um, studied storyboarding, so that way you could tell a story. That's what comic book art really is. You're storytelling with art, with sequential images. And so um, learn cinema, uh, cinema. Even how to um, make movies is essential for an artist to know. And, you know, um, writing books, I, I have all different kinds of books on how to write. And um, so I wish I could name just a few, but there's a lot. Um, uh, you, and my advice to anyone who wants to learn that stuff, get anything you can to help you learn that you think will be useful. Um, anyone can make comments and you just got to learn and apply it all. I found that my learning curve, you know, coming coming from movies, it wasn't it wasn't too difficult to overcome. But I found that instead of writing my, you know, my scene description, like, oh, character walks over here, picks up that, I have to now be far more specific. Like, are we close on this um, angle? Like, what are we exactly seeing? Because that way the artist can then, you know, better interpret my idea. Um, so did you have like any specific learning curves when, when you were learning how to make comics or do you think it's all just trial and error and, and seeing what works? That's a good question. Um, the hardest thing for me to learn was, um, figuring out of what I was doing wasn't working and I didn't exactly have someone who would show me how to do it better. I think one of the things that really, um, triggered the most growth for me was when I learned that my style was very flat artistically speaking um, as an artist my line art had just a, the same thickness on the outline of the figure and sometimes on the, the interior um uh details of the, the um, character or person and it was just flat and so i had to learn how to um create different outlines that had different line width so once i learned how to just kind of let go of some of my um I guess you could say inclinations when I draw and just go with the flow and start to analyze what I'm doing. That's when I started getting better. Um, my figures were stiff. So I learned, you know what, maybe if I do a quarter turn and then um, widen the leg, it starts looking more dynamic. And then if you have someone, you know, doing an action, exaggerate. Use your first intuitive um, um I guess you could say idea and then look at it and say, you know what, make it more um, dynamic, you know, exaggerate it even more. But usually your first idea aren't the best idea. So you have to take it and refine it. And that was kind of where I started to make the most growth. Um, same with writing. You know, you got this, uh, your, your first dialogue is usually your weakest dialogue. Oh, yeah. So you end up, you know, you know um, going back to it. And that's the other thing I learned is step away from it. You know, take some time and then come back with it with fresh eyes. And you're going to see where it's weak, where it's strong. And then, you know, you not just um, brush up the weak areas. Um, you also look at the strong stuff and make it stronger. So that's one of the, the two biggest things that really helped my growth is, you know, um, just kind of analyzing um, your first ideas and seeing what looks off, what could be better, and then stepping away from it. Um, I haven't really analyzed what my biggest learning curve was. Um, so it, it's been kind of a very internal process for me. I haven't had a mentor to say, hey, you know what? That's, you know, we, that's, this is good, that's bad. I've only worked with one editor in my life and she was amazing. Um, and that's actually where I began to make my the greatest amount of growth in my writing and as well as my editing. Because her insight and feedback was invaluable. And so if there's one thing I recommend is get an editor. I, I've learned the hard way, you know, don't self edit. You're not gonna see your mistakes as well. You need someone else's eyes too. And, um, you know, I, I personally, what I love about the comic creation process is actually that process of refining, constantly refining. And, and as you say, stepping away from it, coming back to it, 
um, with my own first issue, I, uh, I have this thing where, um, every project I make it, it, it has to, I call it the cringe test and I, and you have to pass it. <laughs> Otherwise I don't, I don't want to complete it. And I'll constantly come back and be like, okay, what is anything making me cringe? Um, so for instance, like with dialogue, um, at this point, like you said, let go. So, um, I tend to really just write what I need the scene to say, and then completely move on and try to try to figure something else out and not get too caught up on that so i mean you know again this this series is for people who want to make comics um are, are you back in maui right now yes i am i i was born on maui and i've lived here most of my life amazing i i actually wanted to ask uh you know personally over here we have a lot of local comic book shops closing down could you could you talk about the current environment of comic book shops out in hawaii or it, it, you know is, is anything special going on or i can tell you it's really hard um it's very difficult it's not just um up in the um the continental united states where you know comic book shops are closing even here on maui it's really rough um, I was actually working at Maui Comics and Collectibles when the pandemic hit. And um, best job I ever had. It was my dream job. You know, woke up every morning, looked forward to going to work. Um, I would still be working there if not for the pandemic. Um, I was promised to actually, when I was, when I, when I was let go because of the pandemic, I was told, hey, we're going to bring you guys back when this is all over. But... The pandemic hit them really hard. You can't afford employees right now. Um, and I, I imagine a lot of other comic book stores are having that same problem where, you know, the finances of, you know, running a shop is really, really hard. And I think they're also having a hard time selling the comics. Um, I know some comic book shops that have shifted towards selling, like, um, manga rather than Western comics and they shifted towards um, toys and other types of merchandising to kind of help complement the sales of, the sh of their store. Um, I guess what I could say is it's really heartbreaking to see. I want to see everyone do well because you care about this stuff and you love this stuff and you want everyone to just succeed. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Like on, on one side for us Wednesday warriors who are used to going every week and, you know, picking up new books, it, it sucks. I've had, you know, two shops personally that I would go to like all throughout my, my young years and closed down recently. Um, and but, but on the other side, it's kind of, it, it's nice because it made me realize like there's a niche market for people who want to make comics, but also people who want to see you know, more, more indie based comic books. Um, but, but back to your art. So I'm, I'm cu always curious as to how other comic creators, um, like their process work. Um, y you, you follow me on Instagram. So, you know, that I was trying to initially draw the, the book myself and I found it to just be so physically taxing. So, um, on, on your side, I'm sure you're a little bit more accustomed to it, but is, is drawing challenging for you or do you have any like specific things that, that oh, you it is massively challenging for me. Sure, sure. Um, sometimes um, I lose my concentration very, very quickly and I can get distracted. I don't have any um, ADHD or ADD, but um, it is very mentally taxing. I can tell you that because you're concentrating for a long period of time. It's not like, you know, sitting back and playing a video game and just letting your fingers take control. Your hand is doing the drawing, your brain is. And so, yeah, it's physically taxing as well as mentally taxing and i guess if you have some artists it's probably also emotionally taxing because they're pulling themselves into the art there it's not just you know an expression of themselves it's an expression of their emotions too that's going into the piece because they have to care about what they're doing you know so uh yeah it is very mentally physically and i guess you could say emotionally challenging um and the hard part is art takes such a long time you know, there are so many professional artists that are working 16 hours a day, doing it, seven days a week. And some of these guys are fast, too. You know, these guys are the, the type that can do an entire page in one day, which is amazing because the entire process includes thumbnailing, roughing out the page, and then, you know, pencil, inks, if they also do that. So, 
Yeah, that's a lot of work. There's thousands of lines that can go into a single page. That's a lot of work and a lot of time. Yeah, so so if you're if you're also the writer、um, and the artist, do you even bother with making a full script, or do you just tend to get right into the art and and try to get your ideas out? My process is very unique, actually. I don't do like a standard script the way most people do.、Um, I have a an app or a program that I use called Comic Write. And you could actually,、um, I, I write in an almost thumbnail style, so it can mimic the actual comic book art page. And I put panel description in a panel, and then I can also use speech bubbles and sound effects, and I can throw it onto the panel. Oh wow! So、um, while I'm doing that, I can actually imagine it.、Uh, it's a good process for myself because I'm an artist and I think visually. So、um, as I'm writing the, the script of a story. I'm also、um, thumbnailing it in my head as I go, because that way I can determine the, the, the size of the comic panel, the placement of the comic panel, the, the placement of the characters, of what they're doing in that panel. So I don't usually use the,、um, the standard way. Most people do a, a script format, and my my process is very unique. It's very different. I wish I could show you. Um, on my screen,、uh, I don't think I have a. No worries. I'm. I'm actually. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have you send me the name of that app because I'm. I'm interested. That sounds awesome. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, and I can <laughs> even screenshot an example for you. But it, it's a very unique style. I don't know anyone else who does it. But then again, I'm one of the few people you probably know that does both their own writing and their own、um, illustration. So,、um, a lot of times, the writer isn't also the artist. So most likely they're going to be typing it out, but for myself, I can just build my script, if you will, in, in using a thumbnail type of approach. Sure, I'm I'm curious. So if you were to take,、um, you know, your creations in that app, and then say you were actually working with another artist, would you then, I guess, take that and send it to them as well as just like write out actually, what you need to happen? I don't think most artists would like that because they'll feel like they're. It's too controlling or constrictive for them because then you know if you give them the,、um, a screenshot of the script and you've got a,、um, a panel that's like maybe a half a page and then you have three or four vertical panels, they're probably not going to like that because they're going to want a little more control over the visual.、Um, I guess you could say the the, the visual、uh, applications of making the comic book.、Um, Yeah, most artists wouldn't like that. But if you wanted to just kind of use it as a guide, perhaps some artists will be flexible and work with you on that. And you know, as long as you give them the final say in how the page turns out, they'll probably be like, "Yeah, that's cool. I can do that."、Sure. I、yeah. feel like、um, I actually work that way sometimes. Or it'll be specific pages, not the entire book, where、uh, I'm having trouble putting into words what I, I want conveyed. Or you know, putting it into a short enough description that I, that I feel the artist will be able to get it. So I'll just kind of sketch it out and be like, you know, little little arrows here, little arrows there. But then I tell them, make it your own. Like, please do it so much better than every writer feels that way. Every writer feels that way. Let me let, let me tell you off the bat, every writer feels like that.、Um, sometimes they feel like they're they're it's not giving enough control to the artist.、Um, actually, if you ask me. I don't think、um, enough writers use the or take full advantage of the medium, especially in writing scripts. Sometimes I don't think they even give enough description. You know, panel descriptions exist to tell the artist what to draw. Now, I'm not saying not saying you should control what the artist draws, but you need to give them the the the, the building blocks for that panel. You know,、uh, for example,、um, camera distance. You know what? That's a good idea to include.、Um, if you just have a panel that says I only have one sentence, you're probably not doing enough to give the artist everything they need. If the panel description is "Oh, Batman punches the Joker," it's probably giving too little.、Um, if, what if you did it like that? Batman punches the Joker, and the Joker ends up、um, his torso is turned almost halfway around him, and then his eyes are crossed. He's got blood and teeth being spit right out of his mouth. Now it's more,、um, there's more visual information for the artist to use, and you're taking more、uh, advantage of、um, the medium. And and、um, 
you're not taking control away from the artist when you do that. They're giving them everything they need to communicate the story and the panel to the reader. But the writer, you don't have to be Alan Moore and write an entire page for a single panel description. But you know what? You can probably do three or four sentences and still give the uh, artist everything they need to know. Yeah, I don't think enough writers actually take full advantage of um, panel description a lot of times. There was, um, what's that? Radiant Black, the artist for that. I don't know if you saw, he shared a page where um, the, the writer did not even give a single panel description. He just said, oh, um, just do some panel and follow the examples from Invincible um, episode five or six. I don't know if you saw that. He just gave kind of a vague description. And the artist did a five or six panel without any instructions at all. And that's how important um, the artist is to telling the story. But that's an example of a writer, I don't think um, took advantage of um, the medium and the ability to communicate to the, uh, the, right, the artist, sorry. So, so I have two follow-up questions to that then. Uh, one might be, might be a, a good one to start with. Um, so you as an artist, if you're receiving a script from another writer, what do you look for in terms of okay i can i can continue with this or maybe i might have to now you know ask for clarification it's been a long time since I, i've taken a script from another writer and, <laughs> and i to work on it as an um, artist but the two things i need to know from a writer is you know what tell me what to draw i'm not telling you to you know um take control or final say of what i draw but if i don't if I draw something wrong and it's because I don't have enough information, that's on you, the writer. Um, and the second one is, what was it? Um, uh, oh yeah, give me, you know, the, the emotion and the beat of it and the tone of the story. You know, what am I supposed to be accomplishing with this? You know, what's the goal with this panel? Uh, make sure that I can communicate that to the reader. Those are really the two things I need. So, Tell me what to draw and then tell me what it is I have to be conveying to the reader. But the writer, again, he doesn't write to the reader. The writer's script is for the artist. So it is the, the artist who's telling the story to the reader. Sure. And I won't, you know, I won't even send my script off to the artist until I, uh, it, it's the thing where I step away from it at least for a day. I come back and I will either have someone else read it out loud to me or I'll read it out loud to myself. And, you know, anytime I'm getting stumbled on words or I'm like, wait, I like, what, what was I doing there? I, I have to take it back. So for anybody, you know, who I think is going to be approaching writing a script, I think that's a very important, read it out loud, um, especially your dialogue. You're going to get a real good feel for, oh, I keep using this, you know, phrase a lot or, you know, a adding all those those little extra details that may not need, need to be in there. I would like to ask um, if you have any tips for aspiring artists looking to get started, like maybe somebody who's never approached comic book art before, but they just, you know, want to get into it. The two things is master storytelling. I don't care if it's stick figure. Learn how to tell a story with your art. And um, in fact, before you learn anatomy, before you learn perspective or any of those fundamentals, learn how to tell a story. And in fact, pick up storyboarding books before you pick up anatomy books, perspective books, and all that kind of stuff. Your job is a storyteller. And so learn how to tell a story first. And then, you know, when you start getting good, learn appeal, dynamism, um, and the fundamentals of anatomy, proportion, perspective, all of that. And, and, and don't come, don't get me wrong, um, the fundamentals are important. You know, you have to know your fundamentals. Otherwise, you're not going to be a very good artist. But your job is still to be a storyteller, and that's your number one priority. So learn that. Um, you can, like I said, you can tell a comic using stick figures. One of the most successful web comics ever is stick figure web comics. Cyanide and Happiness. To this day, it, it's one of the, the most well-known web comics of all time, and it's extremely successful. And they did it using stick figures. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's exactly like you say, you know, Todd McFarlane didn't build his 
whole career out of drawing Spider-Man proportionately. Uh, eventually, it's like um, it's like that saying: you got to learn the learn the rules so you can know when to break them. And comic books are that medium where you can just really go crazy with it. Your characters don't have to make sense or or anything like that, but you do have to tell a coherent story for your for your audience um, and and you know people outside of your own head. Uh, on the on the flip side, for any emerging writers, what would your you know one tip of advice be for anybody who hasn't written anything in their life before? Writers are a little bit different. Um, one thing I would say is learn how to communicate. You know, um, I, I was just talking a minute ago about how um, some writers don't take full advantage of panel description. Um, learn how to you know um, communicate to the artist because. Um, Stay away from flowery descriptions, like, you know, oh, this is such an emotional panel, this character's feeling in the moment and forgetting to tell the artist what you are. I think it's the types of mistakes that you have to avoid. So learn to be effective in communicating. If you can write an email, you can write a panel description for the artist. And if you can, you know, um, think of it as writing a professional email like that's actually the best way i can describe it panel description are there to be concise and effective and give the artist everything they need and you mentioned dialogue you know sounding it out that's an excellent way of doing it um sound out your dialogue um so you know getting into it you have a character i've been waiting to meet for a really long time her name is windsurfer uh, I would like if you could please talk about her creative origins um, as well as her powers. Well, um, to be honest, I am not really planning to go further with her. Uh, it's kind of a funny thing. I, she was a big part of my life for a long time where I wanted to do winter her. Um, but then I created Captain Photo and I had a really good reaction to that. Better than I've ever had with winter her. And so I've kind of shifted gears and I'm going to go with Captain Photo, but I may do winter her. And, you know, Windsurfer is still very near and dear to uh, I wanted to do like a Mary Marvel type of character with Hawaiians, you know? Absolutely. So, uh, I Absolutely. want more Hawaiian superhero. And the reason I wanted to do her first was because I wanted more female superheroes. But I also wanted someone who, you know, had a surfboard. A surfboard, surfing, that's one of the most Hawaiian things in the world. It is, it's worth surfing with Hawaiian. And it's kind of natural that, you know, a superhero has a surfboard. But um, uh, I chose to do Captain Pono. And I tell you, um, I think I feel really good about it. So, um, Windsurfer, I, I may do that down the line. Sure. Never was, the art, never. was the art finished for Windsurfer, uh, number one? I actually got, like, some pages done. Or, like, maybe about six pages or so. And then, you know... I put it on the side because at that time, my son was born and I became a stay-at-home dad. So I focused on that and, you know, I ended up getting a job shortly after. So between a job and, you know, taking care of my son, I pushed my, my own personal endeavors on the side. But I'm getting back on that horse, so to speak. Awesome. I mean, we were just speaking about how, you know, mentally draining, physically taxing drawing can be. And then with a child, it's like, yeah, you know, some things have to, it is. with great power, you know, great responsibility and all that. <laughs> taking care of my son all day long for more than a year was harder than any job I've ever had. Luke is adorable, by the way. I have to, I have to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, got to got to show love to the fellow super Superman fans. What uh, what were her powers? I I wanted you to talk about that because I, I was looking at your your Kickstarter campaign and I just you know the the art itself is seared into my mind and I was really looking forward to someday meeting her. Um, so I was gonna say like if the art was finished, I'm sure people would at least pick up like a digital uh, version of it if when when you launch Captain yeah. Bono on yeah on any site. I, I mean, she'll do that. Yeah. Uh, so when she was power, she had the ability to control the wind. That's, you know, part of her namesake. But she also had some um, other powers, like super strength and invulnerability. And I, uh, I can't remember. Uh, there was that like, one more other major power. Oh, um, her prevail could actually, she could pull lightning from it. And oh. so, so I don't know if you've heard of um, uh, Kiyaka, her, her skirt had um, lightning, so she could pull lightning from her skirt. So that's where I got the idea. 
That's awesome. Ah, oh, see now, see, okay, okay. We're gonna have to talk off camera about that. Um, so actually, moving on to Captain Pono, I, I've been super curious. I, you know, I don't want to be in the DMs. Talk, Yo, tell me about your characters. Um, could you tell me about his his powers and his creative origin? So Captain Pono is actually very similar. Um, so super strength, uh, flight, invulnerability, and I also borrow the same idea from Windsurfer about pulling lightning, but except it'll be from his uh, feather cloak, his often Ula. And so um, it's going to come from his dad, who is a um, a kualele, that's the term. And he, that means flying god, for those who may not know what that means. And so his dad made a feather cloak, and we're going to pass it off to his son. So um, without getting into spoilers and giving you his background, I want to save it for the actual comic. Um, Captain Pono uh, is, he discovers he is the son of a flying god and the Aloha spirit um, says, you know what, um, your powers have been suppressed, go to access them and your true uh, god form, or Kapua form actually, just say Aloha. And, uh, and the reason he's able to do that is because his Aloha is the purest in the Aina. Oh my god, I love it. I love it. And like, I mean, you know, us fans of Captain Marvel, like Thank you. still refusing Thank you. to call him Shazam. Yeah, like it, it I, I, I love the inspiration, but it's so... I, I don't I call mean, him Shazam. Holy... I mean, you guys, if, no. if people want to call him Shazam, go ahead. But I'll, I'll tell people that there isn't a single main version of the character called Shazam. The one that was post Flashpoint, sure, he was originally called Shazam, but that's not his name anymore. It's the captain. Right. So... I'm happy to say I, that's not his name anymore. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I keep. But, I love when they call they cut him off, Captain M <laughs> and another one. <laughs> yeah, um, I call him Captain Marvel, and mainly because not only do I prefer that name, but I, I feel like I have to respect his original creator. Exactly, it's exactly that because when when I think Captain Marvel, I think of a very different tone, a very different style of art different style of writing and then when i think of shazam it's it's post new 52 pre dawn of dc and, and it's a very specific change and and you know obviously that's what people yeah had a, had a problem with with new 52 um but i would like to ask you know for for everybody who's not informed can you talk about the significance of choosing the word aloha as his power up word i, I didn't quite catch all of that or is that i'm sorry Oh, could you just talk about the significance of choosing the word aloha as his power-up word? I think that, you know, a lot of continental people would really like to um, understand that, yeah. Got it, yeah. Um, I actually wanted a Shazam-type person, who, the wizard, that is, who um, chose the champion. And um, what better type of um, figure would that be besides the aloha spirit? You know, um, aloha? may not be the foundation of the hawaiian culture but it is so important because you know it comes from all of the polynesian uh islands and cultures and even though they have their own spelling and certain concepts attached to it there is one commonality which is love of kin that and you know in hawaii everybody is kin everybody's family we all came from paloa and you know every we came from one common ancestor and so, um, to love everyone, you know, comes with all of the other concepts attached to it. You know, uh, you get free without thought of getting anything in return. So I wanted a concept that would encapsulate the Hawaiian culture and the character. And so I chose the Aloha spirit. And so when she chooses her champion, what would be a better word for him to say to activate his power and become his true form? Aloha. So that's how it came to be. That's how it came the to real be. magic word. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. What about his um his creative origins? Like, had you been working on him like for a while, or did I, you just draw I, it? I, I don't want to say too much, actually. Um, but I, I'll, it would be spoilers to say. Um, but I, I I wanted something that would be very true to Hawaiian mythology, and there are some uh, mo'olelo that. It's about who we are as Hawaiians. And there's one in particular, I'm not going to say what, because if I do, it, people will figure it out and it's spoilers. But um, there's one that 
is probably one of the most sacred ones and I based its origin on that Mo'olelo. And you're going to see it, you're going to understand, once you see it, you'll, everyone who's Hawaiian will know it and recognize it, where the inspiration comes from. Um, but outside of, you know, the, the cultural aspect of it, I, part of how Captain Pono came to be was because when I ran my Captain Marvel account, I had so many fans ask me, oh, what would um, a Hawaiian Shazam or Captain Marvel look like would be what would be the god that forms his acronym i had a whole all of those questions over the years and you know at first i said well his magic word wouldn't be shazam but there's no s or z in the hawaiian language so um you would have to kind of um use different names as transliterate as possible right. It's like um, what they tried to do with Black Adam, where they you yeah. know, keep it's all these letters and stuff. It doesn't work. But then, right, you, you with full creative control, you get to really um, like make it specific. Um, and so, you know, speaking to that specificity, oh crap, we have less than a minute. I, I think the problem is actually the captions. I'm, I was saying a Hawaiian word, so I think the captions might be are, are like kind of fudging up oh, right there. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I was, I was wondering if you could actually talk about the important distinction between mo'olelo and mythology. It, like, in English, I feel like it's commonly mistranslated. Mythology tends to refer to things that um, we don't know how to explain in the natural world. And a lot of times, there's a, a supernatural element to it. Um, in Hawaiian culture, mo'olelo is, um, is not just um, stories about the supernatural. The real distinction from that is um, our mythology also is uh, a historical account of Hawaii, the history of Hawaii, um, but it is mythology and, and largely speaking. So um, yeah, that's what that's what Mo'olelo is in general. Uh, back on back on Captain Pono, really quick, I would like to ask if there's any updates on production, or maybe when can we uh, expect to see him out. Uh, right now, uh, the script is in production, and awesome. so I, I can't wait to get down to art, but I do have obligations that's slowing me down. Currently, I'm on the Maui Strong anthology. I have, I'm have i doing some art duties on that one for the story called Maui Genesis, and um, I also have some lettering obligations to do. So I, right now, I am just going uh, through the script as slowly as I can. As I can, but um, unfortunately, just also have how fast that Oh, um, but that's where things are right now. Uh, ideally speaking, it'll be ready to go for next Maui Comic Con. Awesome. So let's talk about the Maui Strong campaign. Obviously, saving the best for last. Um, could you talk about why this project was so important for you to bring to life? Important for so many reasons. Um, First of all, helping the people that were impacted by the, the Maui fire. It, it was such a massive tragedy that shouldn't have happened, but you know it did, and here we are. And it's just one way of, out of many that we can just help the people here, and the people here are struggling. And so, if you know we could do just one thing to help, we can. Um, that's what one reason why it's so important. But it, another reason why it's so important is that we are continuing to, to perpetuate the Hawaiian culture. Um, you know, we're, we're also making history with this too. This is the first time some of these mo'olelo are being adapted into comic book format for the first time. Um, I'm sure you know that mo'olelo was traditionally told through oral tradition. And, you know, um, with the advent of literature into the Hawaiian culture, we've been able to preserve this, you know, for those who don't pass it on orally, it, it will be a record of, you know, our stories. And, you know, it's also, we have Hawaiian creators on this too. You know, I think that's just a massive impact. It, it elevates the, um, the, the visibility of Hawaiian creators in comic books. And so that's just another, another reason why it's so important what we're doing. Um, I'm sure there are more, but those are just like the three big ones off the top of my head. Absolutely. I have to say congratulations as well. I mean, $10,000 over a $4,000 goal. Like that's, 
that's amazing. Um, and like, could you please talk about your reaction to that and, and how it made you feel um, as a creator, but also as a Hawaiian? I, I was actually pretty worried myself so uh, that we weren't going to kind of get to where I wanted. Um, I was hoping we would get to 15,000. That's, that's I thought would be like the perfect range for us, you know. Um, but once we started getting into um, the 8,000 range, I was very elated. I was happy yes, um, and proud. That, that's another emotion I felt. I, I was very elated to see the success of this project. And, you know, big shout out to Hawaii News Now because um, they're a big reason why our crowdfunding endeavor succeeded. Um, when people saw it on the news, and uh, people just started, you know, um, pledging uh, to support the project. It, it took off after that. So, the power of media. The power of comics. I mean, like, it, and that, that that's too. the most amazing thing i mean so so for me i have to mention i i felt such a tremendous amount of pride you know like i could i could stand up straight when you you know gave me gave me this opportunity and, and seeing how far it's come so i have to thank you for giving me this opportunity first and foremost like it, it's amazing and i have to thank you for bringing together so many hawaiians for the power of comic books like that cannot be understated and i if that, if anybody hasn't told you that i need you to hear it like i need oh. you to hear it you're welcome. You're welcome. But I do want to tell you, you know, um, give yourself some credit because you're doing some really good work and it's going to catch the eye of so many and you're doing something that I, I want to see more of. And the big reason I, I reached out to you is because you're young and have Hawaiian background and, you know, I'll, you're going to connect so many young readers to their culture. You know, the, I can get, you know, the experienced veterans on in the Hawaiian comic book industry, and I have. I got Mark Gold on the project, who is the artist on your story, for those who don't know. But um, there's a powerful, powerful element to having a young creator who has Hawaiian background telling the story of his ancestors. And I'll tell you, it, it'll have a profound impact, not just on the older folks who have been around for a while, but to the younger ones who are gonna be learning about their culture. We are in an, an amazing time. We have a cultural renaissance going on right now. Yes, yes, uh, in the absolutely. Hawaiian culture. And to have someone like you on this project, you know, it was a big gap for me. So um, give yourself a little bit more credit. Don't thank, thank me you. too much. I'm sure, <laughs> sure. I'm sure other people in my position would have reached out to you too. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I, I'm more than sure that this won't be the only one of these that we do. So I, I will be bugging you and I will be bothering you to get another one in. Um, so, so actually, I do want to ask about that. So with the anthology format, did that offer any specific challenges um, as opposed to another comic book? That idea has been um, broached, um, not with um, the Denton Tipton, who is the publisher of Maui Strong, but with uh, Joshua Sky. He is also the writer of um, um, Maui Genesis. So him and I are talking about seeing if maybe we can continue um, telling more of our uh, Mo'olelo. So um, I don't, there's no concrete plans at this time, but you know, uh, never say never because you know, that I, I think that would be a wonderful thing if we can tell more of our Mo'olelo. We, we're only telling five with this one. There's, dozens and dozens and dozens more that we could tell so oh yeah oh yeah so it, it is something it is something that's being discussed that's for sure for anybody who doesn't know i i was able i, I was given the honor to write you know the story of maui battling the sun snaring the sun um so i'm curious could you talk about the story you chose to write and um you know what readers can expect from that uh well joshua sky was the uh, is the writer from maui genesis so um uh, I let the writers choose the types of mo'olelo that they wanted to tell. And then I would try to pair them uh, with an artist who would fit that story best. Uh, for Maui Genesis specifically, I asked Joshua Sky what it is that he wanted to do. And um, so he said he wanted to do um, Maui lifting up the islands. And he just wanted to do something that was epic and so, you know, um, integral to who we are as Hawaiians. 
you know, uh, what what could be more epic than Maui lifting up the entire island? You know, that that's almost in a way the origin of Hawaii itself. And on top of that, you know, he he was very largely influenced by the idea of um, how Maui was considered um, the Hawaiian Superman before Superman ever existed. So he wanted a, a, an epic with um, Maui the demigod. Oh man! Even with the title like Genesis, I remember like seeing the seeing your uh, when you posted the title, I was like, oh my gosh, this <laughs> is gonna be so sick. Yeah, and so um, <laughs> as far as me doing the art, uh, I let everybody um, you know kind of pick their projects, and it just turned out that Maui Genesis was like the last one standing. So Joshua didn't have a say in the artist, so I had I assigned myself to that project, but. Um, I don't think he has any complaints, so fingers crossed, hopefully not. But um, yeah, so I ended up assigning that myself to that story. I had hoped to get more artists on the project, but I, there was one story I wanted to tell. There was supposed to be six Mo'olelo in this anthology, but I had trouble finding you know, a, uh, a sixth artist to do this. Um, what I wanted to do was write and draw my own story. It was going to be about um, Kelea, oh, I'm sorry, um, Kelea, the surf princess of Lahaina. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a love story where she is accidentally kid. well, I shouldn't say accidentally, but she is kidnapped by um, some folks from Oahu, and she actually was supposed to be married off to one of the, um, the prince or the son of a chief. But she falls in love um, with the, the guy that kidnapped her, almost Stockholm Syndrome. But um, she is a very famous historical figure in um, Hawaii, and she's from Lahaina. So I wanted to do her story because of this, her ties to Lahaina as a tribute to uh, the West Side. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to find another artist. So I dropped that story, but I may still do that one down the line. I think you should. I absolutely think you should. Um, and so, you know, we both feel this way. It hasn't been said in this interview just yet, but Hawaiians are severely underrepresented in comic books. Not only is there a lack of creatives, but a lack of characters as well. So I would just like to take this time, if you can think of any um, Hawaiian creators or, or specifically comic creators that people can check out, I'd love to take this time for you to shout them out if you can think of any. You know what? Um, yes. Let me let me talk about some of the guys that have been in comic books for a long time. Someone who influences um, the Hawaiian comic book industry today. Um, he's the creator of Pineapple Man, uh, Sam Campbell. Okay, this guy basically godfathered the modern Hawaiian comic book industry. And at one point, his Pineapple Man outsold back in, in the 90s. So he has had success. And he has influenced a lot of people here, including um, Chris Caraval who is the owner of Mana Comics and the writer of all of his stories. And there's a lot of other guys like um, uh, Chris Cornui. He is the creator of Night Marcher and also the artist for that one. Uh, Chris Lohman, who has done a lot of Mana Comics. DJ uh, Kavitani, you know, fantastic guy and an incredible, incredible artist. And Mark Gold, who has been doing this for a while. That guy is fantastic professional and he knows his stuff you know he had a great sense for storytelling and dynamism uh, so but there's also other folks who aren't directly attached to the um hawaiian comic book industry but are hawaiian nonetheless uh peter stargold who is um the longtime colorist for michael turner he had been coloring comics since the 90s and he had done things like witchblade uh, Soul Fire, Fathom, so on and so forth. And he was also um, Michael Turner's colorist at DC Comics. So, you know, those guys have been blazing the trail for a lot of us. And then there's some young up and comers, um, yourself, if I may say so. And Thank you. there's also Jillian Ikehara, who had a fun, fun style. And she, I, I think she's going to end up being pretty big in, in the future as an artist. So, you know, um, those are the types of people who are in this industry, who love comics, who are fantastic people as well. Um, we talk about a underrepresentation of um, people working in comics. There's also an underrepresentation of characters. Um, you know, if you look at DC Comics, 
outside of King Shark, who can you name for most people? You know, um, <laughs> and it's, it's really sad too, because even King Shark uh, suffers from a lack of, um, I guess you could say, Hawaiian-ness to yes. the way he, he is portrayed. The last time he was seriously portrayed as a Hawaiian and done well was back in the 90s when he was Superboy's villains. Today, you wouldn't know if he was Hawaiian unless someone exactly. said so. That's actually the reason why I chose for him to be introduced back in, in Once a Number One, because I was like, this is a character who has been dumbed down and, and really treated poorly by DC for a really long time. And I saw potential to like tell a tragic story with that and, and take it in a different new, like different direction. And I was like, I'll, I'll figure out the logistics of it later. Honestly, I just really want him in here. Um, but, Preaching but yeah. to the choir. Preaching to the choir. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I have trouble with the way he, he's dumbed down because he is. Uh, based directly on um, the Na Nanawe of Hawaiian folktale. And he was clever, and he had to be because he had to hide who he really was from people. And it, it takes brains to do that because, you know what, if you have a shark mount on your back, you have to figure out ways to, you know, hide that. And, you know, um, also to do what he did, tricking people into going into the water so he could eat them. You know, and and still get away with it, and he did that for years and years and years until you know he got caught. So you know he was a clever person, and I don't agree with the approach of dumbing him down. Uh, even you know just being a bloodthirsty man eater is right doesn't quite do him justice. Mm. No, and if that's your only Hawaiian in the entire roster of your comic book, I feel like that's a little bit racist. Like it's 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 um, playing into also, those. Uh, last time he had any significance was in the '90s in the Superboy um, uh, uh, title, and so you know, I mean, there's some like Mexican folks or you know maybe part Hawaiian and and whatnot, but there are no major characters who have. Um, who are at least primarily Hawaiian or lived in Hawaii. I don't count Havoc. I'm sorry, I will not count Havoc. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, there is a major underrepresentation of Hawaiian characters in, you know, superhero uh, comic book storytelling. And that's immediately why I went uh, fire with my main character because it's like, wh why do we always have to be water-based people? <laughs> like, I, I mean, I understand why we're always water-based people, but why is it always like that? Um, so, so, you know, I just have a couple final questions for you. Um, out of these past couple years, do you have any, uh, I guess, you know, big, big things that you've learned or, or any lessons that you feel like have, have changed how you operate now? Oh, you know what? Yes. And it's really come a lot in the last couple of years. Um, when you turn on this side of where do you figure out what it is that you want to do? You know, um, if you know what you would regret not doing, then um, go ahead and chase the things that you want. You only get one life and one chance to do the things that you want. Um, don't go to your deathbed with the types of regret that you know you will, and will always keep yourself. Um, and also, you know, having a son recently has really changed a lot of things for me, um, especially in terms of what your dreams are. Don't just have dreams just for yourself. Show others, like, you know, your loved ones, what reaching your dreams could look like. Because I grew up with parents who never went after what it is that they really wanted to do. They chose practicality so that they could always provide for us. But there's a way of being both. Uh, you know, to show your kids that this new dream is possible. So th that's really the biggest thing that I have learned in the last couple of years that has had life altering implications for me. And a big part of that comes from having that comic shop. You know, that was life changing to me. But before that, I worked at a job just for the money so I could pay bill. And I was unhappy. You know, I thought I have to do that, you know, just to take care of things and, and live. But um, it changes your, pers your perception and your perspective. When you have a job that you love, you look forward to doing. And once you're done with that, where do you go from there? 
So when you have something like that, you, you kind of start to see or forge um, path for yourself that, you know, you can achieve success doing the things that you love. Definitely. I feel, I feel extremely grateful that I could turn this hobby that I had into, you know, potentially some form of career. But um, it reminds me, the people over at Godhood Comics, they, th- there was a video where um, their creator once said, it was like, uh, when, when your passion and your purpose mix, but like specifically in comic books, this is the only medium where you can like make a profit off of those two things specifically. And I just find that to be a really beautiful, um, you know, sentiment that you offered in terms of that. Um, and so my, my final that. question is, uh, do you have any final advice for people like us who were once those Wednesday warriors with tons of long boxes in their parents' room or, in their, you know, in their parents' house and, and they want to make their own comic book someday? Go for it. Just those three words, go for it. Go for it. You know, uh, if you never do, it won't ever happen. And, you know, even if you go for it and it doesn't succeed, well, guess what? At least you uh, took a shot. Because the only way it works is if you go for it. Absolutely. Well, on that, I'll have to say goodbye to you. But thank you, Carl. Really, really appreciate you taking the time, man. I had a great time talking to you. And, you know, it's finally great to speak face to face. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You have a good one, all right? Okay, you too.